Hi, I'm Jeff from Home Renovation DIY, your YouTube general contractor. Today we are here to talk about how to install a load-bearing beam. That's right, we're going open concept, modern rustic, baby. Got to rip all this out and put in some serious structure. We're going to talk to our structural engineer about how to do this, how to remove the collar ties, these pieces here, so we can have a vaulted ceiling. And of course, we have to be in the basement. We are going to be talking temporary jack posts, footings, point load, carrying beams, cantilevered beams, flush mount, recessed beams. My goodness, we've got all kinds of stuff going on. The difference between concrete foundations and stack stone foundations and all the challenges you're going to face. If it has to do with structure, it's in this video. Coming right at you. So I'm here with my structural engineer, Ethan, from Star Engineering. I've been using Star Engineering for the last few years. Uh, Ethan, this is the first time we've met. Yes. Okay, I usually was working in the east end of Ottawa, so I worked with the guys out of the other office. Okay. Okay. Um, we're in the, the loft here and we want to get rid of the collar ties and that's these big things up here. And I was just having a quick conversation with Ethan about if I want to open the ceiling completely to the top, you're suggesting a ridge beam and we can put one underneath all of the points of this ceiling? Yeah, your best bet here is to, to put the ridge beam up right tight to the, uh, right underneath the peak. Okay. And then that will run all the way to the, the outside balloon wall? Yeah, the outside of the house here. Now that's balloon construction. How much do I need to be able to carry that down? Uh, it that's depends on the size of the beam, okay. on how much weight is on the beam. So if in this case we're maybe 20 feet or so, mm -hmm. um, you're probably looking at a four two by six post, somewhere in that range. Okay, so then I'm gonna have to open up enough of this space to get a four two by six post down right down to the bottom. Yeah, it's gonna to have to be continuous from the peak of the roof all the way down and supported on the foundation. Foundation, so yeah. the, the last floor joist in this package won't be good enough, it has to go right to the foundation? Uh, so it can be done in two separate posts. One, okay. one from the, the bottom of the here beam to, here, to and the floor one from, level, one from there down. and then underneath the floor down to the foundation. Okay, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and then over here, we'd bring this over here. Now. Um, I've got plans for a Murphy bed in here and a bookcase. Okay. So if I was to bring up a structural post here and here and then carry it across, bring it down, does that work? So to do a post beneath the beam. Bring a post down yeah. and then carry it over to two other point loads onto the... Not a problem at all. Okay. You can do it that way and there's an opening below us under this wall anyways. Well, yeah, so the structural support for that opening is behind this, this, this cladding here. So I actually want to bring all that load onto that part of the wall behind this cladding then directly, right? Yeah, that's, that's the best way to do it. I just need to cut open that roof, which is the existing roof. Can you believe this? We'll cut this open, find that beam, and then bring that load to there. Yeah, same sort of idea on this side. You have a post uh, from the bottom of the beam, and it can come right into this wall. Cut. You uh, strip down here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can do that. Or like you were saying, you can do a beam across with two posts. Okay, so I actually want to restore this so I can open up from the other side to get my beam in. Not a problem. Okay, good. Yeah. Now, if I wanted to not put in a ridge beam, I've actually seen a couple of different options. I've seen people put in like uh, uh, steel L's and just tie that all together so that it can't flex and bolt through the wood. Is that an option? It's something we can look at. It's okay. a little more design intensive. Right because essentially right now we have these collar ties nailed into all of the, the rafters. Sure, and we're asking a lot from this really 140 year old wood. Exactly. Under nut and bolt. And, and it's, a lot, <laughs> it's a lot easier to hold it together when you bring this tie further down. Okay, so, so the lower want, it is, the more strength you get. Yeah. So the more ceiling I want, the more engineering I need. Basically. Basically. Yeah. So if I was to sacrifice, let's say moving the collar tie up two feet, okay, and put the collar tie in at that point, I'd be looking at going more like 2 by 10 or 2 by 12, maybe galvanized bolts two times. That, that's the idea. Is that, is that a doable option? It's something I'd have to design back the at numbers? the office, but it's, it's definitely feasible. Okay, so then I could go with a ridge beam for full exposure. Yep. It's labor intensive. Yep. Or we could maximize a little bit of headspace and get more of a 9 or 10 foot ceiling here with something a little bit simpler. Okay, I'm gonna probably look at both options just because I'm curious. 
Yeah, we can definitely look at both. <laughs> oh, awesome. And is there anything, like what we're doing over here, we're basically adding wood so we can get proper insulation and we want to go to R20. Yeah. Okay. But we're adding this 2x4 and this 2x2 here, we actually cut on a 45 so that it, all of this downward force is sitting against that wall. We're just trying to give a little bit more rigidity in this thing. That doesn't factor into your equation at all, does it? it it's really not because these... So these roof rafters now, we're not changing the span at all. So it comes to so span and load and it, Everything is, and is kind of grandfathered in because we're not adding anything new. Okay. So because it's existing, uh, we keep the support essentially the same. So it's supported at the top and at the end. Okay. Um, so anything you add, uh, whether it's to increase the insulation or, or just add some extra that nails doesn't change your math. and rigidity, it's, it's not going to change any design that okay. I have to do. Now, quick question, because I have a crazy plan for the future, Ethan. I would love to cut a piece of here and open up a dormer. Okay. All right? Yeah. If I'm thinking of doing that in the future, is there anything I should do now in, in advance of that so that the structure is in place? Like, if I was to put in a dormer starting tomorrow, what does my structure require? Obviously, two by six doubled up. You're going to need to double up at each side of the dormer. That's each right. Side, anything across... Where I where I'm kind of cut and pivot. Like let's say I want to go to eight feet, and then that's where it's going to lift from. Yeah, so you'll have a, a cross beam wherever the dormer stops. Right. So it'll go, let's say from let's, here. Here across. You go across two or three. Or and is that a double as well? To be. Uh, again, it depends on the loads. Okay. So it'd be something I have to design. Sure. But you're more than likely going to be good with a double two by eight. Okay. Something in that range, but it would have to be engineered. So if I was to cheat <laughs> and, and put in double two by six after the collar ties are gone on both sides and then cut across a double two by six with joist hangers so that next spring I can call you up and say, hey, this is what I did. Can I open this up? Are you going to need me to pull the ceiling open or if I take pictures, is that enough or should I engineer it now? It should be engineered now. Okay. Most of the time with the permit process, you can you can include other items even if it's the work is not to be done right away okay so you can have that included in the package right and be specific and only work on this area or, or that area at a time yeah because the city only cares if you're putting your stamp on it at the end of the day the the city is normally very fast at giving you your permit yes whenever we have already taken the responsibility oh, because yeah th that's why they have rules right yeah. Listen, at the end of the day, the city has certain rules, and if you work inside their box, you're fine. They can approve it. As soon as you move outside their box, you need guys like Ethan to say, yes, we're good. Here's a stamp to prove it. We've done the math. You're safe. Okay, awesome. Let's go talk about the main structure of the house now. Let's do it. Beautiful. Okay, so part of my challenge as a homeowner um, is the fact that I've got enough experience with doing uh, structural work that I, my mind gets ahead of myself. From your perspective, what's more important, um, interior structure or the exterior walls? Like, what would say, wow, you got to deal with this first? It's if I had to choose, if, if, I, if I had a financial <laughs> restriction, I had to choose, what would you do first? Shore up the outside wall or shore up the middle of the house? It is, I would say it's a case by case basis, <laughs> uh, depending on I love that. what's going so on. You're a politician now, aren't you? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I mean, it's, it's whatever needs it most. Okay. So if, if your floor is sagging, if you feel vibration when you walk up top. Yeah, I, I literally probably, live in a sponge cake. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably more important to take care of the inside okay. space. Good. If you're if out from outside, you see bowing in the wall, you have, have cracking going on, yep. water coming in, uh, it may be an issue that needs to be addressed first. So it, it is definitely a case-by-case -case basis as okay. to how, to how to go about that. But the biggest concern would be houses are more prone to collapse from the inside than from the outside. Generally, I would say so. Okay, yes. all right. So the idea here is if we renovate the inside of this house, I want to get these trees in the middle lifted up in a position and get them permanently supported. For two reasons. One, having the permanent support in the middle of the house enables me to put in temporary support a couple feet from the exterior wall at a later date so I can fix my foundation. For sure. Right? And it allows me to complete the renovations inside the house so that I can increase the value of the home 
and put me in a position where I can get an estimate done on the value of the home so I can then afford to do the work on the exterior of the house. <laughs> Makes sense. Which is another issue. Okay, what kind of scenario is most ideal for dealing with trees? What do you do with this? Every one of these is a different dimension. So it's, it's not the easiest thing to work with. And right. nowadays, they don't teach you anything like that in school. Okay. Because it's, they don't use it in any new construction. Exactly. And you're not even going to see it in old construction unless it's very old. But well, there's a lot of houses I've been in, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, and they're, 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 they're all floor joist package, right? Like even here, this house has got floor joists everywhere else except the basement. And everything in this house is clear span one side of the next. So I'm not sure what they were thinking. <laughs> like did someone in, invent the bandsaw the day after they put this foundation in? <laughs> wow. it, it's hard to explain. And normally when I come on, on any site and I come down into the basement first, it's normally where the most structure is, is visible. Hmm. I'm going to assume that it's the same. It's built the same all the way up. Right. So whenever they do different things, it's, it always seems to throw me off. So I'm kind of thinking like these trees were in their way when they built the house. They cut them down, dug a hole, put up the walls, and then pulled the trees back across to get started. That's kind of how I'm feeling about this because the lumber was already there and it was free. It, it, was, it wasn't a, an uncommon technique back then. I yeah. mean, you see sometimes the sizes are vastly different. Here, at least, they, they look it's pretty nominal. constant. They're, yeah, you know, it's like, it, it, it's relatively the same. Yeah. Okay, so we want to do... The idea of we need basically two structural loads on each side of the staircase because the house is cut in half by the stairs. Right. You know, I came in here with a preconceived notion of the idea of putting in a point load over here, underneath here, going right across over top of the foundation wall and cantilevering the load coming from the second floor onto that. Is, is that, is that wishful thinking or is that, is that reasonable with today's technology? It can definitely be, de be done. Um, so again, depending on what sort of weight we have coming down on the cantilevered section, yep. that will limit our, our design uh, okay. for, for a beam down here. Because I know, you know almost anything is possible with a big piece of steel. That's right. But as a DIYer, I'm trying my best on this channel to show people how to do things themselves. So if, if you can come at it from the approach of um, uh, laminating lumber and steel together as components once they're in the basement, that would be more ideal. I would rather have a piece of steel with pre-drilled holes, according to an engineer drawing, yeah. that I can put on the wood, template, drill the holes, come back to the other side, install it in place, jack it all up, you know, just me with one helper. That makes a lot more sense for the, the system that I'm going with here. Well, yeah, it's not easy to slide a, a big, continuous, heavy steel beam. Right? in through especially with all these posts everywhere yeah like i don't have a lot of playroom and and i've been in companies where we'd call all the crews and you know 14 guys would show up and we'd all carry a beam in that's not happening on this job <laughs> so we'd try to try to keep things under a couple hundred pounds per unit would be great yeah and install them one at a time so if we can come up with a design plan for picking that up on both sides this wall over here has a limitation of about 10 inches that side is, doesn't, it's a much bigger size. I have a, like 13 inches over there. Okay. So if that makes any difference. Um, it, it definitely makes a difference. Uh, the depth of the beam is really what's governing its strength. You can go wider, but it's really not giving you a whole lot of extra strength compared to increasing its depth. Really? Yeah. Would it make sense then on this side, if I was to remove part of the foundation wall in order to let the beam go all the way out? to do a little bit of a pocket. Yeah. Depending on the design, for sure, that could really, I mean, it could be the difference between a steel beam or that laminated LVL. Okay, so if that's necessary to go to the laminated, go that direction. Yeah, Okay. For sure. Fabulous, and well, let's go back upstairs and we'll talk about, um, we wanna do two different things. Either. One, we wanna do a recess beam, and one, we wanna carry the load from underneath and do flush mount. Okay. Um, just so that, you know, we have a bathroom, so we're gonna go with the coffered ceiling. No need to get too fancy, but on the other side of the room, we want to put it up as high as possible and really expose all of that original ceiling. So let's have a quick look yeah, in there. Let's do that. All right. So Ethan, we're going to go modern rustic. And in design world, that means open concept. That's what everyone's doing now. Open ceiling. So we want to expose the floor joists 
and the tongue and groove floor from above, right? And have it all exposed. We're gonna try to move as much wiring and heating into corners and, yeah. and false ceiling action as we can, but we wanna have a beam. And since we need a structural beam in this room, we like it because we really don't have a tall ceiling. Right. It's a really big room for exactly seven and a half feet. <laughs> kind of is lousy, really. I don't know how many layers are in the ceiling. I'm guessing almost two inches, maybe more. I guess we'll find out once the demolition <laughs> right? starts. Right, but the, so the secret for me is if I'm gonna put a beam from basically that side of the room, which is that wall, into this interior wall, what does the building code require from me now for support for that beam? So anything we do, any renovations we do today, yep. have to meet today's building code. Right. So whatever was here before, once we go ahead and start trying to change it, right. it doesn't matter how that was built or if it met the code from 20, 50 There's years There's no ago. grandfather rule if you're making modifications. That's right. Exactly. That's exactly right. So whatever we design today, any new beam, uh, has to be designed to today's code. Okay, so if we have a, let's call the exterior structure an actual four inch, then my beam needs to reach right to the exterior cladding because if I'm, unless I'm, a beam needs to sit on at least three inches of solid material, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So for, that they can't slip beam. off? Yeah, that's okay. the idea. So you don't have an accidental force to right. shift it off. And normally for beams, you have a lot of pressure Yep. at each end so you need enough bearing resistance bearing area exactly to transfer that weight without crushing so an actual two by four beam means that i'm going to have a little bit of wiggle room up there so if i if i have let's say 12 or 16 exact feet i could get a beam at 15 11 so it's easy to install split the difference on each end i still have three and a half inches of meat on each side to carry that i'm okay yeah as long as you have that bearing then, okay then we're good all right, and what do we need to use to tie it all together? Is it just nails or just the gravity? What are we using? So normally what we like to recommend is a little above and beyond the building code requirements. Sure. It's, and it's still simple, it's just a clip angle. Thin piece of steel from the post to the beam, yep. an L shape, and, and you nail directly into each member okay. instead of toe nailing. If I have a, a post the same width as my beam, do you want to have another two by four or something traveling up past the beam so that there's no rollover? That's also a great idea. And then yeah. that, that's important when you're underneath structure. What if, like in this situation, I'm planning on cutting all the joists out. So I'm going to need an interior wall and you're going to spec that out for me, right? Usually within two feet, something that's measured and cut to fit, right? And yeah, then so carry the load and then I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to slide the beam up. I'm going to add joist hangers for, and then jack them all in. Oh my God. That's going to be a busy day. <laughs> but once I have that beam in place, it, there's not much risk of rollover, is what I'm saying. Once the new beam is, is yeah. up in between the joists? Right. No, because you'll also probably do a, a temporary support underneath the beam before the actual before post, the actual goes, post in goes in as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good point. All right, so is there any problem? This room is an actual 16 feet long. Is there any problem going LVL in this situation? Again, it all depends on, on how much weight we have coming from above. Okay. Is it just the floor or do we have the floor and the roof uh, supported? Generally just the floor, actually, yeah, yeah. in this case. So in, in this case, if it's just the floor, LVL, uh, I mean, LVL will definitely be acceptable. You yep. have depths up to 18 inches. Right. Uh, obviously, if you're going flush beam, we want to keep it as small as possible to, okay, so to avoid case, the bulk. If I have a two by 10 floor joist package up here, which I think I do, which is not acceptable no matter what's going on. <laughs> not, not at this. Um, uh, if, I, if I put an LVL two by 10 in, is a triple enough over 16 feet? Or am I better to go 12 and then try to cap it all with something decorative after the fact? You're probably going to be looking at 12, okay. just based on my experience. But sure. again, every case is different, so I'd have to do run, the numbers. run the numbers. But it's yeah. good for me to be thinking, don't be disappointed if we have to go 12. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so for my design, then I'm gonna think I'm gonna, I'm gonna clad the beam itself anyway, so I can cover all of the joist hangers. And yeah. then when I'm finished, I'm gonna have a painted ceiling and then an exposed raw finished beam. Takes a little extra work, but I think it's gonna be pretty. And better be safe than sorry. Yeah. Okay, let's go talk about the other beam because it's totally different. This one's yeah. gonna be carry and load. And then we see if we can cheat a little bit over on that side. Yeah, let's look at the other side. <laughs> 
So Ethan, we're over here in the, in the I guess we're gonna call it living, sitting area, slash kitchen. We've got a beam here, and I don't have any idea how it's done. Uh, not happy with the structural load because the point load here doesn't actually go anywhere. It's just sitting on the, the floor. Which we know is already It's overspanned. a disaster. And, and, and I look really short right now, but you know, like, okay, we're dropping, I think somewhere around two to three inches over the last couple of feet here. The house is collapsing in the middle. Right. Our plan is to remove the entire wall from beside the stairs, where we know we have structure going clear span, to the outside wall, same as the other side. Yeah. Although in this situation, because above us is a bathroom, we're not gonna go exposed ceiling. We're gonna go with a coffered ceiling look. So we're gonna allow ourselves the luxury of a beam underneath all the joist package, which right. simplifies my life Easier a little bit. Easier to install. Easier to install, right? So there's a definite cost difference and time difference in that. Engineering it, Relatively the same, same it's load, same span. Essentially, it's, it's the same thing, okay. except we're not worried about joist hangers. Yeah, uh, exactly. In this case, the joist will just sit right on top of it. Yep. And the beam goes in, almost the exact same sort of calculations go into designing this one as at the other side. Okay, so the assumption is that the joists are clear span. Yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> like, I didn't know they made 20 foot joists. In the old days, is that common yeah. enough that we can assume that? Or I, I would say for a house this age, it's a good assumption. Really? Okay. But even if they're not, as long as both joists bear on the beam in this bulkhead. Okay. So as long and the new beam is going. Worst spot. case scenario, I've got a joist coming from each end, and it butts up together. How much? How much beam do I need on each side of each joist? To carry that for joist you want to have a minimum 1.5 inches okay that's the bearing requirement most likely if you do have two joists yeah they won't butt up they'll they, actually they usually be overlap they usually overlap yeah. but my worst case scenario is they butt up and in that case if they all butt up and they're in a line then a double is enough then a double would be enough if they're perfectly in line yes. so when i open all this up if I call you up and say, hey, thanks for the beam. It's a double LVL by 12. However, my joists are butt up and they're not in line. I need to make this a triple. Is that a phone call or is that a site visit? Uh, a phone call would be fine in that case. Okay. Most of the time, if, if we have specified a, a double after we've done our design yeah. and you need to add an, a third ply, sure. there's not gonna be any issue. Um, as to, long as we add a third ply on the point loads as well, yeah, as long as we have that minimum bearing condition met, okay. All right. adding extra strength to the beam is not going to raise any flags, okay. hopefully, with anybody. So our process here is site inspection today. You're going to give me a, um, a plan to follow. Yeah. And as long as that plan meets all of the conditions of bearing load and transfer and movement, we're fine. If there's any adjustments, we'll call you up and let you know. And if you have to make another site visit to modify something, then we'll do it at that time. Sometimes that's necessary, especially in older homes. If, <laughs> if the ceilings aren't opened up. It's always surprises, up, right? You, you never know what you're <laughs> gonna find when you open up these walls or okay. these ceilings. Do you do a, a last visit to inspect before you stamp? Um, no, so our design will be stamped based on just this visit and okay. all the information we've talked about. All right. Um, we will have uh, the, the bearing conditions and other stipulations sure, sure. Uh, that, that we've kind of discussed here. Kind of so then it in, really in falls on notes. me if anything falls out of line with that. Exactly, so we have okay. to, there'll be a note and it'll say something like uh, contractor or, or owner to verify this condition is met, that condition right. is met. If these uh, are not met, uh, call engineer before proceeding with work. So in the world of liability, you're, you're covered with your stamp because you're yes. now placing responsibility on the person doing the work to make sure they comply with all of those limitations. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's good to know as a homeowner. Like just because you've got a plan from an engineer doesn't mean you can do whatever the heck you want after that. You still got to comply with what he says. All right, Ethan, pleasure having you out here today, buddy. All right. Good to meet you. Thanks, Jeff. And look forward to getting these plans. What kind of timeline do you expect to, for turnaround once you do a site visit to having plans available? Is so it normally uh, at our firm, we're looking at 
between one to two weeks turnaround time. Wow, that's fantastic. From the site visit. Okay. Yeah. Wow. How about that? All right. <laughs> well, now you go. Now you've had a complete walkthrough. You've got the structural engineer. You have an idea of the hell that I'm living in and what I got to get done. We are going to see you again for step-by-step -step reconstruction of the entire house. I can't wait to show you the finished product. Make sure to check out all the videos on our modern rustic farmhouse remodel and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>